All right, so today we are going to be entering the void. Thus far in our unit, we have discussed that objects are created with both a state and a behavior. We can use the constructor of an object to both create and initialize the object, which is going to fill in the object's state. So if I make a rectangle object called my rect, and I initialize it with my rectangle constructor with a width of 12 and a height of 5, like we've been doing for the past couple classes, I'm going to get this rectangle object and have that state. So there's our state, half of our state and behavior. But once I have my state, how can I change the behavior of my objects? So in this rectangle example, I filled in my state with its width and height. How can I find the area or perimeter of a rectangle once I've initialized it? And the answer to that question is methods or functions. We can control the behavior of an object by defining methods, which are also known as functions. So um, if you've taken another programming class, you might recognize the word functions rather than methods. Um, some languages also use the word uh, procedures as their primary nomenclature for this idea. Um, in this class, uh, CodeHS is primarily going to use the word methods to refer to them. So uh, just keep that in mind. So if we want to add to the behavior of an object, all we need to do is create a method in that object's class, and then that object will have access to that method. So if you remember back to our full rectangle implementation, the full thing that I showed you a while ago, we have our uh, instance variables, we have our constructor, we've been learning about that for the past couple classes, and then down here, all the rest of this are the methods for our class. This is all of the functions that are built into our rectangle class that we will be able to use when we create a rectangle object. So let's look at how we build a method. So there are First, the first thing we need to do is write the signature of the method. Uh, and this is going to involve four things. First, we need an access specifier. And this is either the private or the public keyword. Uh, and for right now, all of our methods are, we're just going to make them public uh, until we know more about what private and public actually do. So for right now, stick with public we are going to need a return type as our second thing. This is the type of value that your method will return when your method has finished its operations. Uh, we'll learn more about return types in a few classes. Uh, so for right now, we're going to use the type void, which means that there is no return type. So we've got two things already, and we already know what they are both going to be. We have public and void, easy. Thing three is the name of our method, and it should be descriptive of what the method is going to be doing, and it is going to follow the same rules as the naming of variables. So um, you got use the lower camel case, uh, having it be descriptive. You can't start with a number, things like that. And our fourth thing is the parameter list. Just like a constructor, a method is able to accept parameters. So let's look at an actual example of what this looks like. So let's say I make my method signature public void print area. And I have my empty parentheses. Public is our access specifier. And like I said on the last slide, for right now, all of our methods are going to be public. So just it's required for us to have it there. So we're going to just keep it as public. 
here's our, record, our return type. Uh, this method will not be returning any value, so its return type is void. Uh, and in a couple classes, we're going to talk about making our methods have a return type, but for right now, we're going to stick with void. Next is our method's name. Uh, and this method is going to print out the area of our rectangle. And so we've named it print area. The name is going to do, it's, it, the name is descriptive of what the method will be doing. And again, our name is in lower camel case, first word lowercase. Each subsequent word has its first letter capitalized. And then last, we have our parameter list. Uh, sometimes our methods don't need any information to run, so their parameter list will be empty. And next lesson is going to be about adding parameters to our methods. Any questions so far? Is anything unclear? So, once we have built our method signature, we're going to build the rest of the method. So, first thing we're going to add is these curly braces. And all of the code for our method is going to live in between those curly braces. And the curly brace can live either there or on the next line. Um, Java doesn't care where the opening curly brace is. As long as it's after your signature, Java is happy. So my personal preference is to have my opening curly brace on the same line. But like I said, Java doesn't care. So if you like how this looks better, by all means, do it that way. So there are two steps to actually printing our rectangles area. Step one, we have to calculate the area of the rectangle so that we know what it is. So how can we calculate the area of a rectangle? What do I need to do? What is required for a rectangles area length and width length and width or width and height is, is the words we've been using so in order to calculate the area we need to multiply our width and our height together so my i'm going to make a variable area it's going to be an integer it's going to be equal to width times height now where are width and height coming from here We remember back to our whole rectangle class implementation. We have our two instance variables, width and height. And the instance variables for a class can be used wherever we want within that class. So once I initialize my width and height within my constructor, those variables are able to be used absolutely wherever within my actual code or within the, the methods for that class. So when I've assigned my width and height from this constructor, I can access those values and multiply them together to find my area. All right, that knowledge. After I have found my area, all I'm going to do is print it with my System.out.println. Does, does this process for building a method make sense? Cool. All right, so let's look at an example of how to use it. Once I have built my method, I am able to call that method. And calling a method is the word for when we use the code inside that method. 
So in order to call a method, I need to reference the object I want to call it on or call it from, use a period or a dot, and then I need to say the name of the method. So if I want to call the print area method on a rectangle object that is named my rect, I would say my rect dot print area, which is going to print the area of this rectangle object. If I have multiple different rectangle objects, I would need to use each of their names individually to print their area. I would say my rect dot print area, rect two dot print area, etc. So let's actually look at what it would look like to run this code. Over on the left, we have our rectangle class with our constructor and our print area method. Over on the right is where we're going to add our code in our main method. And we can see, hey, public void main, we have a method in our my program class. So main is a method just the same as print area is a method, but it's just, it's, it's, its name is special, so it does a special thing. It is always going to be run when we run our program. So uh, in our main, first we want to actually create a rectangle. So let's declare my rectangle. It's a rectangle type. Name is my rect. And I'm going to use my rectangle constructor with 8 and 12. So when this line of code runs, we're going to jump over into our rectangle class. 8 is going to get fed to rect width. 12 is going to get fed to rect height. Now we're in this method. We're in this constructor. So this line is going to run. Width is going to equal rect width. So the value of that parameter is going to get saved up into my instance variable width. The next line is going to run. Rect height is going to get saved into my height variable. So now my height instance variable equals 12. I have now initialized both of my instance variables. And my constructor has finished running. So I can jump back into main and run its next line of code. We're going to run our, we're going to call our print area method on my rect. So this line of code is going to run. We're going to jump over here. We're going to run int area equals width times height. We're going to grab width. We're going to grab height. We're going to multiply them together. 8 times 12 is 96. And then we're going to run our next line of code. We're going to print the value in our variable area. We're going to print out 96. Now that this code has finished, now that our print area is done, we're going to jump back into our main method once again. And then anything after this line of code will now run. Does that sequence of hopping back and forth and how, it, how the sequence works make sense? from main into our class and then back. Uh, yes. All right. Cool. If I do not initialize my object, if I do not call my constructor on my rectangle object, and I try to call one of the methods in that uh, in that object, I'm going to get an error saying, hey, you didn't initialize that object. I, you, I don't have any access to that, to that method because my rect is going to have that null value in its box and null doesn't have a print area. We need to make sure that our objects are initialized to actually equal an object, 
in order to gain access to those methods. Does that make sense? Sweet. All right, so um, we are clients of the scanner class, like we discussed, and we have already been using methods, actually. Next int, next double, and next line are all methods that can be accessed from a scanner typed object, like we have done with our input dot next int. In our input variable is a scanner typed object, and we can call those methods from that variable. So even though we don't know what code went into building each of these methods, we know how to use them in our, in our programs. I don't need to know how the, the scanner class works at a base level in order to use the scanner class. And this is called procedural abstraction. And an abstraction is when we remove complexity from a system to make it easier to use or, or to interface with. So the scanner class is abstracting away the need for us to interact with the keyboard at all. All we need to do is create our scanner object, say you're going to access the keyboard, and then we can call our next int, next double, and next line methods and it will just give us the information that the user types in on the keyboard. We don't have to worry about any of how they work. We just need to know that they work and how to use them. Does that make sense? All right. That is our lesson for today.